Good evening and welcome. I'm Sarah Sanchez. I am honored to serve as the Director of Programs and Communications for the National Association for Urban Debate Leagues, also known as NODL. NODL serves as a backbone organization for 20 urban debate leagues across the country, known as the Urban Debate Network. Working together, this dynamic network addresses a tremendous gap in the education landscape, helping students build the skills that elevate academic achievement, verbal communication, public speaking, and civic engagement. Now more than ever, we believe that the power of amplifying voices and fostering open dialogue as catalysts for a better future. For the fifth season, we are thrilled and excited to present I Resolve, a public debate series launched in 2020 with a goal of engaging high school debaters in real conversations about the most pressing issues in their communities. Tonight, we are elated to bring you this program in partnership with the Washington Urban Debate League for the third year in the row, kicking off this series. This debate showcase provides a platform for students to demonstrate their talents of persuasion, research, crit and critical thinking honed through participation in competitive debate. Unlike what often passes for political debate on TV, this evening we hope our students affirm your faith in the great American tradition of debate, which is rooted in thoughtful analysis, evidence, and respectful discourse in, on the critical issues that face our communities. For the past few weeks, our students have been preparing well-developed arguments that propose viable solutions to reform elections in the United States. In tonight's debate, students will compare and contrast a strategy of increasing voter turnout by expanding mail-in balloting with an alternative strategy for expanding the right to vote to 16-year-olds. After the debater's initial arguments, our esteemed guest panelists will offer commentary on their arguments, providing both perspective and feedback, and the students will synthesize that in their final summations for the audience. This dynamic discussion is possible with the help of our generous 2024 iResolve financial sponsors. I want to acknowledge with personal appreciation our series sponsor, the Asia Group Foundation, who we are fortunate to have with us in this room. Thank you for your continued commitment to NODL and in particular this public platform for our students. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not extend our gratitude to Planet Word. I cannot think of a better venue to highlight our students' voices than a museum that is dedicated to highlighting the power of words and what they can do for our students and our future. With that, I am pleased to introduce to you David Trigo, the Director of Programming and Development for our league representing Washington, D.C. and Prince George's County, to say a few words and introduce tonight's debaters and panelists we hope you enjoy your evening, and I'll be back as the moderator in a little bit. So like, so like our programming, um, I have also growing past the previous speaker here. Um, and I'm very excited to be here this evening. P doing debate has been one of the most passionate and uh, meaningful things that I've ever done. And I always tell folks, uh, do something that makes you want to get up and go to work. So I'm very excited to be able to do that. And it's because I get to work with some great young people. Some of them are here today and you're gonna listen to them. Some of them are sitting in the audience and you're gonna hear from them five, six, seven years from now because we have a great pipeline of young t folks doing some really creative stuff all the way down to the elementary school level. It is my uh, privilege to introduce some folks this evening. Um, first of all, I'm gonna start with our wonderful debaters. Um, we were talking last week and Maria really didn't want me to pu pull up some sixth or seventh grade photos. And in the interest of you know, keeping her mind in the game, I decided not to. Those are, those are for the after party. <laughs> um, but whether, you know, 
we are very excited to have her join us today as someone who debated in middle school and was in that terrible like summer of 2020 COVID lab that I taught over the summer. It was pretty rough. We were figuring a lot of things out. I mean, we, were, we did what we could. <laughs> um, and so come on up. For, give it up for Maria Montgomery. <clears throat> <laughs> At the opposite end of the spectrum and hoping for some vigorous debate tonight, um, I'm excited to introduce uh, a gentleman who has not even started his second year of debate yet, uh, though we're sure it's going to be a good one. Uh, Duval High School, as many of you know, has been one of our powerhouses for a long time. And their longtime coach, Dr. Price, took over again last year. And he said, you know, we're back. And I'm like, man, you're back. We'll see about the rest. <laughs> and then his, all his new recruits swept the novice division at the first tournament. And I was like, oh, OK, you're back. <laughs> and uh, from that you know, great introduction, uh, this young man ran into JV and then ran into varsity. and. Um, sometimes didn't even know what division he was in and didn't really care. He was just there to have a good debate. And uh, without further ado, Sangeeth Matthew. So I hope you all brought flow paper because I expect good notes from every single person here. Um, I am going to, however, uh, point out a few people who get away, get to you know get away with not flowing and just asking a few questions. Um, we have a very distinguished panel of judges and commentators tonight, and as Sarah mentioned, one of the fun wrinkles today is that you don't just get cross X from your opponent; you get it from the experts too. And I've told several of them already to not go easy on them, so good luck. Um, I guess I will go left to right here. Um, Dorian Warren is a advocate, a policymaker, a journalist, a any other adjectives I should be adding here. <laughs> He's got a great suit, and I just discovered that he uh, debated for the reigning national champion Kenwood High School uh, a little further ago than last year. So <laughs> we're very glad to have Dorian with us. <laughs> Um, I don't have any high school stories about you, man. <laughs> um, Bruce, <laughs> class of 84, Bruce is a excellent uh, attorney specializing in voting rights. Uh, many of you should recognize him from the ballot uh, last cycle where he ran for attorney general of, of DC. Uh, he has a long career of doing um, advocacy and work on voting rights in both in DC and nationally. Um, and perfectly timed, um, we also have Congressman Jamie Raskin of Montgomery County. Uh, <laughs> so I now have just 44 more introductions, um, but I think I'll skip them. You're here to hear from the kids, not me. So I believe, Sangeeth, you're kicking it off? Yep. I'll start talking. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> In the 2020 presidential election, 237.7 million people were eligible to vote. Now, how many people actually voted? 158.4 million. This means that almost 80 million people, 80 million, 80 million eligible voters did not cast a vote, even though this was the highest voter, voter turnout in election history. That's almost as many votes as President Biden received and a few more million votes than Donald Trump received. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Thank you for coming together to learn more about a topic of vital importance for the future of our democracy, electoral reform. As a democratic nation, we should ensure that all citizens have equal opportunities and access to the right to vote, which is why I'm advocating for universal mail-in voting. There are three main reasons <clears throat> we should adopt universal mail-in voting. First, it increases voter turnout. Second, it provides voters with a smoother voting experience. And third, it helps counteract efforts to suppress voting. As we navigate the modern complexities of voting, it's crucial to recognize why the system of universal mail-in voting is not only helpful, but essential to maintaining the health of our democracy. First, let's address some failures of the current voting system. According to the Pew Research Center, only 66% of eligible voters cast votes for the 2020 presidential election. Like I said, what happened to the other 34%? I know I wouldn't be happy with those 66 on an assessment grade. According to an article from Global Citizen, the top reason for citizens not voting is because they don't have access to polling centers, which is even harder now as thousands of polling centers have closed due to a variety of reasons. In addition, as election day is a single day, polling centers can be prone to long lines. This is bad for a variety of reasons, <clears throat> as it discourages people, especially people with jobs, from voting. If we are able to increase access and provide other means of voting, then we will have increased voter turnout, leading to more represented and strengthened democracy. Now, what is universal mail-in voting? Essentially, it is a practice of states sending out ballots by mail to eligible voters. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, only eight states, including DC, have universal mail-in voting. This leaves out 81% of eligible voters in the United States. It is empirically proven that universal mail-in voting increases voter turnout. Let's take Colorado as an example. Colorado saw a 76.4% voter turnout for the 2020 election. This was well above the national average of 66%. Universal mail-in voting makes it easier to vote and gives more access to voting. By removing logistical hurdles, we encourage higher engagement in the electoral process. And this is especially important in smaller elections or in communities where voter turnout is historically low. In addition, universal mail-in voting can relieve polling center congestion and prevent long lines. Creating a more efficient voting process is essential to encouraging more people to vote. Universal mail-in voting also increases the amount of time that an individual has to vote. This allows for more accessibility and enables citizens to be more informed about their options on the ballot. Lastly, universal mail-in voting can help counteract efforts to suppress voter turnout through means such as restrictive voter ID laws or limited polling station access, which can be see seen in states like Florida and Texas. <clears throat> Opponents of universal mail-in voting cite the lack of security as a main concern with claims of stolen or forged ballots, voter impersonation or coercion, and fraud. However, a study by the Oregon Legislative Fiscal Office found that out of 61 million mail-in ballots cast in the state between 2000 and 2019, there were only 38 convictions for voting fraud. This is a rate of 0.00006%. See how many zeros that was? This shows that fraud is barely existent and should not be an area of concern for universal mail-in voting. In addition, there are many safeguards set in place by states to avoid voter fraud, including signature verification and using election management systems to track all ballots cast to prevent double voting. To conclude, we should support and adopt the practice of universal mail-in voting nationally as it increases voter turnout, provides citizens with smoother voting experience, and prevents the suppression of voting. As we progress as a nation, it is essential to strengthen our democracy, and it starts by revolutionizing the way we, the way we vote by adopting universal mail-in voting. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> OK. Um, so starting off with cross-examination, um, how do we ensure that people will actually use this new system uh, consistently? Yeah, thank you for that question. So citizens would be encouraged to vote by mail as it makes the entire process simpler for them. They have the option to vote at the comfort of their homes instead of going to polling centers and waiting hours to cast a vote. I know I wouldn't want to wait hours to do a task that just takes a simple minutes. I believe that in, in and of itself 
would be an encouraging factor for people to vote. Not only that, public education campaigns would have a focus on mail-in voting, and they would continually encourage people and provide them with information to send in their ballots. Not only that, we have information from Colorado and Oregon that prove that um, voters come out at um, a higher rate compared to national averages with universal mail-in voting. Okay, and you said approximately 80 million people could have cast their vote, but they did not in the 2020 election. What about this new system will make them want to vote now? Yes, that is correct. People were not able to vote in the 2020 presidential election due to a variety of reasons, including lack of transportation, work schedules, and long wait times and polling stations. And universal mail-in voting can actually solve all these issues as it increases accessibility and provides the opportunity to vote without logistical hurdles. People will have the option either to vote in person or receive a ballot through the mail. And giving people these options encourages them and makes it easier to vote. By reducing barriers and increasing convenience, mail-in voting will help bring more of the 80 million non-voters into future elections. Absolutely. Okay, and so for my final question, what happens to people who are frequently moving, live in dorms, um, with so much focus on other things in their life, how do we ensure that their addresses are updated and that they're doing that themselves? Mm -hmm. So before we send out the mail-in ballots, um, there will be, um, uh, we, we will make sure that the addre addresses are updated and mail is going to the right places. Um, and we will, ask to pe we will ask people to verify their place of residence. And I do hope that people give their correct address. I mean, that will be their fault if they don't. Um, however, if they do encounter these issues, there are, are always election offices to go to to resolve these issues. Not only that, they do have the option to um, go through traditional means of voting and go to polling st centers. And if we, look at, um, if we look at Colorado and Oregon as an example, they are able to carry out these elections even with the influx of mail. And this shows that it is indeed possible to have mail-in voting without the worry of missing ballots or other uh, mail issues. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Maria Montgomery. I'm a senior in high school and I'm 17 years old and I will not be able to vote in a presidential election until I'm 21. Because I was born four months too late, I don't have the opportunity to vote in what may be the most consequential election of my, of presidential election of my life. And to me and many other youths, that is a big issue. When we talk about election reform, most of the time, people think about how to get more people who can vote voting and ignore the fact that there is a very simple solution that would drastically increase voter turnout, lowering the voting age to 16. There are three main benefits to lowering the voting age. The first is diversity and consistency. There are approximately 8.4 million youths aged 16 to 17 in the United States. Youth of color make up a majority of that number. Allowing these youths to vote would substantially diversify the voting pool. Research from the Pew Research Center shows that white voters are more consistent with showing up to polls on voting day. Uh, this means that it is highly unlikely for issues that affect people of color to be thought of while voting. It means that over time, more candidates will have less of a reason to platform their issues when campaigning. Allowing a more diverse audience to begin voting earlier means that consistency can be built up and boost the amount of non-white voters showing up at polls consistently as they age. Consistency is key when it comes to voting. And allowing younger, younger voters to begin building that earlier in life allows them to confidently proceed as they age. Providing new and diverse groups of voters this right ensures that voices across the board are heard. The second benefit is the support that high school provides. Beginning voting in high school while students are still required to take classes like government and history gives them a huge boost. These classes and others in the realm of social studies uh, and humanities can provide younger voters with insight into not only the voting system, but the history and the context of the issues involved in the election. High school also provides a sense of the community that can be hard to find in college. According to the League of Women Voters, voting is substantially harder when younger students move on to higher education. A substantial number of young voters who attend out-of-state colleges retain their residency in their home state. Uh, and many states require that you register with a state ID to vote. 
While some states have more relaxed laws, many do not accept student IDs um, when voters register. This on top of the fact that it could be their very first time voting, as it will be for me, creates additional hurdles that young and experienced voters have to jump through and can kill motivation for them to vote. Now I wanna address some of the concerns relating to lowering the voting, to, related to lowering the voting age to 16. Those I have heard most frequently are, teens aren't mature enough. They'll just vote for whoever their parents vote for. They'll support unqualified candidates like celebrities, as if adults are immune to celebrity worship. <laughs> On maturity, teens are old enough to work a job while attending school. I did it. Not to mention, when they work, they don't get all that money. You know why? Because part of it is held back for state and federal taxes. Why am I allowed to pay for the government, but I don't get any say in where the money goes? For the argument they'll vote alongside their parents, this is a concern that can be addressed by my plan. If we get students voting sooner, and most of the information is coming from outside of their parents, they'll be, more or they'll be much more likely to make their own decisions. The final benefit is the amplification of young voices. Allowing people 16 up to vote is providing us with a real way to make ourselves heard. Frequently, because of how our system is set up, we rely on older voters and legislators to make decisions on behalf of the youth because we cannot do it ourselves. This means that policies and candidates that are not favored by older voters have a substantially lower chance of gaining traction, and this can have devastating effects on youth. Younger people are consistently reminded of the fact that we are the future. We have expectations heaped on us as we are, as we are reminded of the fact that we are the up and coming generation. Yet issues that we have concerns about are frequently the ones that are most ignored. Students wake up to go to school and have to wonder if they'll be faced with an active shooter on their campus because our pleas for stricter gun laws have been ignored. Young girls are forced to carry babies that their bodies can't handle or that they don't have the means to care for for uh, reasons of morality. We're meant to be the future, but we are unable to advocate those who will ensure we actually have one. Thank you. Hello? All right, perfect. All right. <clears throat> Statistically, it has been shown that voting turnout rates for voters aged 18 to 25 are lower than other age groups. What effect would lowering the voting age have on this issue, and will it make it better? Absolutely. So like I mentioned earlier in my speech, uh, consistency is key. When, like I mentioned, voters are, younger voters are launched out into the world, they have other stuff to handle, college, um, maybe they're moving out of state, et cetera often voting can fall to the back of their mind because they haven't done it. They haven't built that up, that up that consistency. Starting at a younger age allows them to begin earlier and like I said, be surrounded by others who will be able to kind of boost them up, explain how this happens. Um, and often people don't aren't voting because they feel as if their voice isn't being heard. As you may know, you have to be 18 to sign a legal document on your own behalf. Why should you be able to vote at 16 and not sign a legal document for yourself? Where is the consistency in that? Absolutely. Um, I do not believe that the fact that younger people that cannot sign a legal document should be grounds for them not being able to vote. Um, historically, that has been kind of an issue. Um, women weren't allowed to own credit cards until much later in the 1900s, and they were giving voting rights in the earlier 1900s. Um, so if we think about it, it's kind of that removal of autonomy. Um, it's not a reason to disenfranchise people simply because they can't sign a document. It's just another issue that needs to be solved. How well are 16 year olds educated about political processes and issues and what improvements would you be needed in civic education if the voting age is lowered? Um, I think a lot of young people, like you and me and many others in the audience, have a grasp on politics, especially those who are in organiza or, uh, organizations like ours, the We Debate. I know that a lot of people think, oh, you know, you know, young people are on the internet all the time, and a lot of people see that as a bad thing, but I also think it substantially gets people more involved. Um, and I believe that even those who are not as into debate as we are, or as politically inclined, still know um, what they believe, and they can make that choice, I like this candidate, I like their policies. Um, and I think that's enough, uh, especially since we could say the same about many, many adults. Thank you so much.
right. How is that for some debate? We're going to turn the tables on our debaters here for a minute. We're going to ask each of our panelists to address one question to each of our debaters um, on their cases. And Mr. Ward, we'll start with you. Oh. So you said one question? I can't ask seven? You can ask one of each of them. We do have, we do have a each. clock tonight. They're going to kick us out of Planet <laughs> Word eventually. Um, Mr. Matthew, very compelling argument. Uh, and I am wondering for you, why not just call for what um, Norm Ornstein's colleague, E.J. Dion, has called for, and that is mandatory voting or universal civic duty voting. Why not just have a system of mandatory voting that'll solve your problem much better than mail-in voting? And for Ms. Montgomery, my question to you is, what happened after we lowered the voting age to 18 in the early 70s? Did we see evidence of an increase in voting by younger people? Talk to us about why the evidence shows this would increase youth voting. Um, I think that many would say that there was not a large increase um, after the age was lowered. Um, and I feel like I've read about people being a little disappointed with that and arguing as to why we shouldn't lower it now. However, I feel like there's a big difference between younger people in the 1900s and younger people in the, what's the 20? <laughs> in the 2020s, I'll say it like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like there have been a lot of changes, especially with the internet, social media. Um, I looked over this question a lot when I was researching, and I really thought about it, and I was like, well, a lot of younger people aren't as politically inclined, and stuff like that. However, I feel like there has been a shift recently, especially with the protests in uh, around 2020 for Black Lives Matter, and even now with Palestine, I believe it is youth leading the charge. Um, I believe it is youth leading the charge. It is youth in the streets marching. It is youth on social media spreading information. I know because I've been to marches. I've been there with other people my age and I've spoken out. And so I feel like there has been a shift and you can see it. Um, even though many believe maybe there hasn't been. First of all, sir, thank you for your question. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, when I was uh, researching what my topic would be, I actually did encounter the topic of mandatory voting. and. Um, theoretically, it would solve the issue of voter turnout. I mean, if we have mandatory voting, every registered voter would be able to would vote. But you know, as Americans, we pride ourselves with having freedom, right? For number one freedom uh, in the world. So I feel like if we have um, that, it's very contradictory in that sense. And not only that, it's it's a big shift from our traditional means of voting. Um, the reason why I uh, wanted to go with uh, universal mail-in voting is that states already have implemented these systems, and it does not take uh, a lot of resources or a lot of resources to carry out the system of voting. Um, states have absentee mail-in mail-in voting. If we are able to just send ballots to all uh, registered voters, then they have that increased accessibility rather than forcing them to vote. The, thank you for your question, sir. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Spiva, we'll start with you. We'll go to you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, is it Matthew or Matthews? Matthew. Matthew, okay. Um, I, I wanted to, I was curious about the nuts and bolts of implementing the system uh, that, that you're advocating. Um, and let me, let me ask you about two things. It's one question, but two <laughs> aspects of this. Um, uh, one, uh, you have a, a problem in a lot of places in this country. I have a sister who lives in the Atlanta area. It sometimes takes two, three weeks for mail to get, uh, even when there's, it's sent within the same area from one, from point A to point B. And of course, these laws always require that uh, the ballot arrive um, within a certain number of days of the election. Um, uh, what, ha, that, that seems to involve another entity other than uh, the election officials. It's the U.S. Post Office. And how do you, how do you address that? 
and then the second part uh, would be um, how do you how do you get um, people registered? Because my understanding is the biggest impediment to people voting today is is not being registered. Um, so how do you get them registered uh, to um, to vote? So I'll start with you, and then I'll, I, if I can, I'll come back and, and uh, have some questions from uh, Ms. Montgomery. Is that correct? Okay. You, are, you absolutely can do that. All right. All right. Um, so first of all, I do understand that it is a concern with uh, the time for mail to get to people. However, we have to um, acknowledge the fact that there is time between um, receiving the mail-in ballot to elections, so people will have adequate time in order to uh, be able to cast in their ballots via mail. Uh, not only that, um, they do have the option of going to polling centers. So uh, my advocacy is not only just universal mail-in voting, but universal mail-in voting in conjunction with traditional means of voting. So I do believe that um, people will still be able to um, vote even if we are able to do that. And as for the second part of the question what, uh, about registration, so um, with my advocacy, I want to have more public um, campaigning about registration to vote. We need more of a word about why voting is important and why people should uh, register to vote. Not only that, um, I believe that uh, re um, registering to vote should be easier. So whenever people go to DMV and get their um, uh, licenses, there, they are able to register to vote. Not only that, um, uh, as a personal experience, I was able to register to vote in um, local elections at school itself. So um, as for registration, it will be increasing. The we do it right in the district. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I go to Maryland, so uh, yeah. 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 Do it, they do it okay in Maryland, better. too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh yeah, Maryland, PG County, yeah. So um, yeah, so I do believe that with registration, it just, it's just about increasing the um, uh, the uh, ways in which one can get registered for voting. But thank you for that question, sir. Thank, thank you for your answer. Um, and, and Ms. Montgomery, so a couple people already stole my thunder. I was going to ask you about the fact that 18-year-olds to 29-year-olds don't don't vote, bite in, vote in as high a proportion. But um, let me ask you this. I mean, you can't vote until 18. You can't drink a beer until 21, not legally at least. And, uh, um, and some of us have advocated that in the, with respect to the criminal justice system, that, that really uh, young people shouldn't be held fully accountable or should at least been gi be given a second chance because of science, the science of brain development until more like 25. What, um, what why do you conclude that uh, young folks if you buy the premise that, that there are other things for which young people are not ready for, even at 18, what makes you think they're ready at 16 for such a consequential decision as to who should be the next president? And, um, and, and well, let me leave it at that, actually. Yeah. Absolutely. So throughout my research, I did find like a lot of people saying, you know, your brain isn't fully developed until you're, till you're about 25, et cetera. And every time I saw that, I kind of thought of the fact, I had a job. I worked for about one and nearly two years. Um, same job, constantly interacting with people. And a bit of my money went out of my paycheck to the government. And every time I saw that, I was like, why am I working paying the government? And I, you know, I don't get to really decide where it goes. And that was a lot of my basis. And I found, you know, Maturity obviously plays into it, but I think back and I think to what I see on the news occasionally and I think some adults aren't ready for this either. No <laughs> offense, no offense. But it's like, you know, we're saying they're not ready. They're not ready for this. They're not ready for that. Oh, but you can get a job. You can start saving for your college tuition. You can have a baby whether you want to or not. There's so many things that maybe a lot of me thinks, well, why am I able to do this? I can't do this. Why am I able to give the government my money? I don't get to say where it goes. And that was the basis for me saying, well, voting, I'm politically inclined. I know other people are. Why can't I vote? And that was really the basis for my advocacy. Thank you so much. We'll Thank you. Pass the mic. Awesome. Uh, and we will finish up the panelist question and answer period here with Representative Raskin. Awesome. Uh, First of all, I got to say I was um, 
persuaded by both of you, by <laughs> your excellent arguments. Uh, having said that, um, Mr. Matthew, let me start with you. Um, I want to ask you both kind of a, a quick little practical question and then um, maybe a more philosophical one. But practically speaking, y you kept saying that uh, all you need to do, you know, what, why, why turn voting into an act that requires a couple of hours when it can be done in one minute, but you make it sound like the, the letter magically disappears from your hand and then ends up in the polling place. I mean, you know, I know a lot of young people, like 18 and 19 year olds, who literally told me that when they did their mail-in ballot for the first time, um, it was the first time they'd ever been to the post office or went to a mailbox <laughs> because they do everything online. Um, so you're, you're saying that that everybody, instead of making that long, arduous trip to the polling place, should instead make the long, arduous trip to the post office or to a mailbox, right? And, you know, is that really safer? Um, I, I don't mean the trek there, but I mean the voting um, in that way. And I guess the second question, which is kind of the cultural dimension of it, is um, you know, the post office was a very big deal with the founders of the country, and Benjamin Franklin, of course, was a first postmaster general, and um, the committees of correspondence operated through the post office. But nobody back then advocated voting that way because they thought that voting was a communal activity, that people would get together and they would drink and they would debate and they would caucus and people would vote. Sometimes it, w it wasn't even a secret ballot at that point, but... Um, and it was a, it was more like a holiday, but you're reducing it into a totally private kind of uh, endeavor from home and cutting it off from that social dimension. First of all, thank you, Congressman, for your questions. They were very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm sure your answer will be. So <laughs> Hopefully, I, I do hope so. I'm not a congressman, so we'll see about it. Yet. <laughs> All right, so as for mailbox access and um, mail-in voting, so I do believe, I um, uh, do address the concerns that um, it actually does take effort to go to mail-in, um, to, to go to post offices and mail-in voting, but it's all about um, what's convenient for an individual, right? Whether it's going to polling centers or giving that mailbox. And um, my uh, analogy when it comes to hours and minutes is about the time waiting which would discourage people from voting when it comes to polling centers, uh, not about the time it takes for um, carrying out the civic duty of voting. So essentially, I mean, the voting itself would take minutes, but for mail-in voting, it does um, take mailbox access. But um, like I said, it's more about uh, the situation in w um, which an individual finds themselves in and which one they seem convenient. So. Yeah, that's my answer to the, f to the first part of the question. And second part, I do acknowledge that um, uh, the Founding Fathers did f um, find voting as a communal um, gathering, and it is a civic duty that everyone should participate in as we are a democratic nation. However, like I said, with that situational circumstances, the reason w the first instances of mail-in voting was actually during the Civil War when um, soldiers needed access to voting, and they did that by um, mail. So it all depends on what we're faced with. And really the... Um, uh, really it's kind of like a civil war today, you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with the way Democrats and Republicans are fighting today, it yeah. does seem like one. But um, yeah, and not only that, people do have the option to go to polling centers and have that sticker where it says, I voted today. Um, which is part of the reason why people do vote. I mean, it's a very great sticker. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like I said, it's all about the situation and what an individual finds himself in. And they do have a variety of options uh, which they would want convenient, whether it's by going to uh, polling centers, waiting hours in a line and voting to get that one sticker, or to go um, and sit at home, file, uh, oh, sorry, not file, but uh, fill in the ballot and sending it off to mail. Um, but yeah, thank you for your question, Congressman. All right. And um, Ms. Montgomery, and I, I love your last name as well as your presentation. Uh, <laughs> um, so, well, l let's start with this. Um, the, the 26th Amendment, to my recollection, uh, lowered the voting age to 18 um, from 21. So it was a three-year drop. Um, 
if we were to follow that precedent, we would go from 18 to 15. Why do you stop at 16? Um, I think a lot of 15-year-olds would want to know uh, what's wrong with them. Um, so a lot of my uh, advocacy was based on a campaign I saw and kind of signed up to be a part of, uh, Vote 16 uh, USA. Um, and I read their reasoning. I thought about like how I was at 15, even though I would consider myself still politically inclined at the age. Um, but I feel as if 16 is when you kind of, when I was talking about like schools, 16 I felt is kind of when like things got serious in like social studies, um, whatever history class I was taking at the time. Uh, this one I took like advanced world history um, and stuff like that. And I feel like for me at least there was a shift between 15 and 16 and I felt at least myself that was a big thing, but also it was mainly because of the Vote 16 USA campaign that I decided on 16. Yeah, and let me ask you one other question from the 1900s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, um, and I guess you are fully 21st century human beings. That makes sense to me. Um, uh, so I might, I have some colleagues who might be interested in your proposal and they would say let's lower the voting age to 16 and also lower uh, the age for purchase of uh, firearms too as another basic civil right. So you would agree with that presumably? Uh, I would not. I think that there's a, ooh, sorry. I think that there's a big difference between owning a item that is essentially, you know, self-protection or, you know, death, killing, et cetera, um, and being able to vote for a candidate. Sure, if you're going to vote for a candidate, you might be voting for a candidate that says, yeah, I want everybody to own a gun, I want everybody to have firearms and stuff, but there's a big difference between doing that and then as a 16-year-old being able to go out and buy a weapon of destruction. Um, so for me, you know, I'm not advocating <laughs> for not only the voting age to be lowered and that to be lowered, but I think that there is a big difference between having your voice heard politically, but then also active, and then there's a difference between that and then being able to go out and buy a gun, especially with, you know, I mentioned school shootings in my speech. Um, I just don't think that those two are comparable, even though maybe you have colleg colleagues that believe it. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that very much. I yield back. Wonderful. Uh, one more time for our panelists and debaters. We're going to turn the tables a little bit right now. So our debaters are going to prep their final speeches with the feedback and questions that they have just gotten from our panelists. And I am going to ask some questions of our panelists. Um, I, I'm just going to start with a really basic one. You all work in industries where debate is essential. Uh, Congress, Congress the law, community organizing. What did you see tonight from our debaters and do you think it could inform some of the work that y'all do? And Representative Raskin, I'll start. With well, yeah, first of all, I would say those, would, those two speeches would be in the top 10 best speeches of the 118th Congress uh, <laughs> in the House of Representatives. And, <clears throat> um, and uh, I appreciate the fact that they listen politely to one another and they didn't call each other names. Um, <laughs> there was no ad hominem attacks. Um, and um, they addressed the substance of people's questions in a really meaningful and soulful and responsive way. And so, um, you know, I, we don't see a, a lot of old fashioned style debate in Congress anymore. Um, and so this gives me a lot of hope. And, um, uh, and both of these proposals specifically are very important for us to be talking about. That is, how do we get much closer to 100% participation in voting? And, um, you know, I, I didn't get in my questions into the whole federal state thing. Is this something that you're advocating nationally or just for a particular state or locality? Um, but that would be one way that somebody would try to undermine a national mail-in plan, saying, oh, this is a state's issue let the states do it the way they want. And you know, and we do have this ridiculous electoral patchwork uh, checkerboard of different laws in different places. And Georgia now has a law, check this out, I, because my colleague Nakima Williams from Georgia was just telling it to me, in Georgia now, the law says 
that um, on election day, there will be a manual count of the ballots and the normal electronic count of the ballots. And if they differ in any way, then the vote does not have to be certified. Um, and then it's up to this new special election board that has been created above and beyond the normal uh, electoral machinery. But this is the kind of thing that's going on. But of course, the Supreme Court had to um, basically read Section 3 of the 14th Amendment out of the Constitution, saying that insurrectionists couldn't hold federal or state office again if they'd sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution, because it might create differences in the electoral practices in the states, which of course is the entire nature of our system. Um, but so um, anyway, um, yeah, you, you guys should um, hurry up and turn 25. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, they're not congressmen yet, but someday. Uh, yeah. Mr. Spiva. Thank you. Um, it, it's uh, Spiva, just to, uh, no, 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 no worries. No, no, no worries at all. Um, I appreciate the correction. So, um, but, uh, so first of all, great uh, job, guys, both of you did uh, just a terrific job. Um, and second, everything that um, Congressman Ra Raskin, Raskin said. Um, I am uh, yeah, a lawyer, uh, and I work uh, and have for a long time now, uh, primarily in the voting rights uh, and redistricting, you know, which is closely aligned uh, field. And so my heart was on uh, both of your sides, actually. So it was, it was hard. I had to conjure up my, my best uh, kind of opposing counsel. Um, uh, but I've done, I've done a number of different, I uh, practiced in a number of different areas. And, uh, and I was a high school debater way back in the day in the, in the uh, Paleolithic uh, age. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that there is something about that experience that has, uh, prepared me and that I've used probably every day uh, of my life uh, since then uh, because really in any profession um, and particularly in law, it's all about how pr to persuade uh, people to um, uh, your point of view, to, to establish some policy um, and, uh, and you know, you do it the way you two did it. Um, by acknowledging where their weaknesses and how you've thought about it, and how you would get past or overcome those weaknesses, um, and uh, and I think that um, you know it's critical to preparation for for any field that that you might ultimately go into. Wonderful. And Mr. Ward, you work in community organizing. What do you see from our debaters, and how does it inform the work that you do? Well, actually, I'm going to start with my other job, I'm a former college professor and political scientist, and both of you really spoke to my head with good, earnest, good faith argumentation with, oh my God, evidence and facts and things that we could all look up and agree are facts. Um, so thank you for that, and, and that's, of course, what we expect. Um, generally, as a, I would say, most of us in a society would expect argumentation with evidence and facts. So that's the professor, former professor side of me. The community organizer side of me, though, really appreciated how they both linked their personal stories to those facts and argumentation, because part of persuasion is connecting with your audience, and, t and it's storytelling. Yes, making an argument. <laughs> yes, with evidence. Yes, with some structure. But you both did a really great job of connecting to your personal stories, but you didn't you didn't do the fallacy of us making us assume your personal story is fact. You linked it to how you're representative of, in many ways, a generation. So I really appreciated that. And then my final thought, and just listening to you, listening to you both, and thinking about congressmen, um, the congressmen's colleagues, I think we should absolutely mount a campaign tomorrow to lower the voting age for Congress. <laughs> Maybe it should also be 16. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left here before our debaters are going to deliver their final summations. But I do just want to highlight one other element of debate that I think is critical and that we saw on display here. And that's the art of listening, which is one of those things that I don't know that we do as much in society sometimes. And one of the things that I see when I listen to these two debaters, they really listen to each other and respond to what those concerns are. Can you speak a little bit, each of you, to how listening works in your realm and, and what maybe you learned through debate or your participation in debate that helped you with listening? And Mr. Warren, I'll start with you. 
We'll just go in reverse order. Oh boy, I'm thinking about, um, I'm a new parent, so listening is really important. <laughs> you don't have to think about this yet, but listening is actually active. Listening is in every sphere of life is really, really important um, because I think at the end of the day, it shows that you have, it, it's a human connection and particularly one of, it, it opens the door to empathy. And you can't get to empathy and under, putting yourself in someone else's shoes without active listening. And it's a critical skill for everything we do in life and we don't do enough of it. And I just really was inspired by the way the two debaters actually really were attentive, not only to each other, but to us as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, I second all of that. And um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing to do, particularly if you're in a debate, right? Because you're, you're, yes. you're worried that, oh, if yes. the person gets this out, I'm not going to be able to respond or I'm not going to be able to think of what I want to say next. Uh, and, um, but you can, and actually you're going to be much better you're going to have a much better response um, if you grapple with the difficulty of what the other person is saying. Because usually, in most debates, um, there's something to the other side. Um, and, uh, and sometimes there's a lot to the other side. It doesn't mean you give up your position, but, but you're, you'll make your best case and your best argument, and certainly the best case for persuading the other person um, uh, if you really grapple with, and that starts with listening to their position. And I'll say as a lawyer, it is the most critical thing for examining a witness, uh, either in a deposition or on the stand. Um, uh, you know, I, I remember I had a case um, where I had to cross-examine a witness who was a, a fairly high-level election official, and I, for some reason I don't think we had a deposition. Usually... I mean, it's unlike TV, you, it's all kind of scripted. You kind of know what, you know, they know what you're going to ask them. And, you know, but this one, I didn't have a deposition and I had like nothing. And I kind of stood up and I was like, you know, waiting for the Lord to give me my questions. And, and um, but one of the relevant things, because it was about outreach for voter ID and outreach to minority communities, and it was in Wisconsin. Uh, and she was telling me about all this great outreach they had done. And first thing I acknowledge, I said, you know, you seem like a very dedicated public servant and someone who's really trying to do the best you can. Uh, is that fair? Of course, nobody's going to argue with that. I'm a fair person. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, um, how many uh, black people work uh, in your agency? Um, uh, well, um, I don't know the number. Um, uh, how, many, how many Latino folks work in your agency? Uh, well, you know, well, we've had diversity um, in our agency before. I said, I noticed you used the past tense. <laughs> I said, are there any people of color in your agency? And again, it was one of these things where I, I had nothing. But because I was listening to what she had to say, um, you know, I could actually kind of make a point uh, that, that supported our position, basically. So that's well, all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Spiley. Thank you. Uh, Representative Raskin. Yeah, um, but I'm not quite sure what rules you guys use in your debate tournaments or in the league. Um, but I was thinking about my son, Tommy, who was a debater in high school, and I was fascinated. I'd never done it. I was not part of that. Um, and he used to listen really carefully and really get into explanations with people. And um, he didn't do that well with the judges because at least in the kind they were doing, it favored rapid fire point making. And he was, you know, so he was always a crowd favorite because he was doing, um, you know, the dialogic thing. And, but a lot of the, I know the debate formats favor rapid fire scoring as many points as possible. Um, but, um, you know, in Congress, I'll just say that I'm impressed by how little people listen to each other. I mean, you can, literally if people get up on opposite sides of an issue and never engage each other's arguments at all. They just stick with what it is that they want to say, which is disappointing and it also makes it a lot less fun to be there. And the conversation never really moves, so it's just like an exercise of brute power. We think we've got the votes and we're just going to stick with this story um, and so on. I. Um, 
and that's true on both sides of the aisle. A lot of my colleagues really have stopped listening to a lot of the MAGA people when they talk, but I think that they miss important things when they don't listen. And so I listen very carefully when we get into the gun violence conversations. And what I always hear when you really listen to what they're saying is, well, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers, we feel bad like everybody else, but nothing can be done because of the Second Amendment. And when they get into, you know, explaining their view of the Second Amendment, they think that the Second Amendment means the people have to possess an arsenal equal in firepower to that of the government because the Second Amendment gives the people the right to overthrow the government. And so um, now when I say that, I mean, I've researched their claims, which I think are completely fictitious and empty, and I go right to that and I try to engage them um, with it and at least disorients them a little bit as opposed to doing what our side mostly does, and rightfully so, is to talk about the human carnage and the costs of the violence, but it is important to listen to what the other side is saying if you want to move the dialogue forward, which after all is the whole purpose of having debate in the first place, I think. Yes, it is, and with that, I think our debaters are probably ready to rock, so I'm gonna turn the stage back over to them. After they are done, uh, we will get a few final comments from our esteemed panel here, and then some closing words from uh, Mr. Trigo. Thank you all so much. Grab this. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, on the topic of electoral reform, we should nationally adopt the practice of universal mail in voting for three reasons. Firstly, universal mail in voting increases voter turnout as it makes voting more accessible to citizens, and it's been empirically proven that states like Colorado and Oregon who have implemented universal mail-in voting have substantially higher averages of uh, voter turnout compared to national averages. And this is not only in the presidential elections, but also in general and midterm elections. Secondly, universal mail-in voting provides citizens with a smoother voting experience. With a system of universal mail-in voting, citizens can vote at the comfort of their homes and take time to be fully informed <clears throat> of who they're voting for and what policies they are advocating. In addition, Universal mail-in voting allows citizens um, with more time and more opportunities to vote rather than being restricted to just one day, which is impossible for people with jobs and people that just can't make it to polling centers. Lastly, universal mail-in voting prevents voter suppression by making it easier for people to vote. In addition, as it would be a federal mandate, states cannot implement restrictive measures to mitigate the civ civic duty of voting. To address some of the questions that were asked, Mail-in voting provides citizens with increased accessibility when it comes to voting. Therefore, increasing the amount of turnout and in including more people in the electoral process. As for, as for mandatory voting, that's a great idea and would have 100% voter turnout. However, as Americans, we pride ourselves as having the freedom of choice. And I don't really think that will be a, a great change and will be popular amongst Americans. Lastly, I do believe that we should provide means of voting to provide convenience for voters, whether they prefer that communal style where they wait hours for that glorious sticker or vote in the comfort of their homes with mail-in voting. We should prioritize passing universal mail-in voting rather than decreasing the voting age for a variety of reasons. For one, it is easier to implement universal mail-in voting as many states are already doing it. Decreasing the voting age would require the passing of a constitutional amendment, which hasn't been done in decades. Not only that, we should prioritize increasing voter turnout for current registered voters, as it has been shown that younger voters tend not to vote. Young voters simply lack the concern for civic duties, as shown in voter turnouts for ages 18 to 25. And I do believe that it is more important to increase voter turnout for that 80 million non-voters rather than just bringing in seven to eight million 16 and 17 year olds. Not only that, lowering the voting age would throw off the consistency in other legal matters. 16 year olds should not be able to vote if they can't even sign a legal document on their own behalf. 
It may be nice goal to bring in young vo younger voters in the franchise in the long run. However, we should prioritize bringing in voters for the short term. Therefore, with all the provided reasons, we should adopt the option of universal mail-in voting for a more resilient, represented, and stronger democracy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close tonight, I hope we can all understand that having more voters in general is a net benefit. Having a voice in politics at a younger age is a good thing. Allowing voters to vote younger equals consistency. It's like running a marathon. The earlier you start, the earlier you start and the more prepared you are, uh, the better you'll be. Launching an out-of-state college student into voting for the first time is like running a 24-mile race after jogging on a treadmill for 20 minutes at your local Planet Fitness. It's true that universal mail-in voting may get more people out, but to change things systemically, you have to get people involved when they are younger. Voting and being involved in civil action earlier means that young voters are more prepared. A lot of the time, I hear people who can vote say things like, I'm just one person, my vote doesn't matter. And I look at them and I think, wow. Because as someone who can't vote and would love to, it's frustrating. I have to sit around while decisions are being made about my livelihood, my body, and my future without my input, and listen to people who can't actually have a say in it complain. In response to the questions I would ask, why well, was asked, while many argue that because immediately after the 26th Amendment was ratified, younger people didn't turn out rates that many would consider worth it, I mentioned there has been a shift. With the introduction of the internet and social media, it has allowed youth to engage with, social, with political issues on a different level. Again, like I mentioned, think back to BLM and even now with Palestine. Youth are leading the charge. It has been younger people using their voices. Yes, it is hard to get a constitutional amendment passed, and many would try to twist my advocacy into something it should not be. Like an example, allowing six-year-olds to also purchase firearms. But this does not mean we shouldn't try. It is my belief that if I can work and I can contribute, then I should be able to vote. I was asked, you know, why vote at 16? A lot of people have worries about brain development, how mature you are, and I hate to say it, but I have met many adults who are able to vote, and I see them on my screen spewing hateful, untrue, and I hate to say it again, stupid rhetoric. Unfortunately, maturity does not always come with age, and honestly, if we're going to speak on the maturity of young people, let's talk about, what, let's talk about it with those older as well. In response to my opponent, the fact that younger people can't sign a legal document is another example of the removal of autonomy from younger people, not a reason they shouldn't be able to vote. The right to vote often precedes people's ability to enter into certain contracts. Women weren't able to own credit cards until the 1970s. Does that mean they shouldn't have been, a vote, they shouldn't have been able to vote until then? Um, there's no guarantee that many won't forget to play their, place their ballot back in their mailbox. There's no guarantee that the Postal Service will be able to accurately distribute millions of ballots for voters. Um, universal mail-in voting is trying to stop a band-aid on a gaping wound infected by years of governmental oppression. Allowing younger people to vote is real systemic change. And I'm sure a lot of us would love to have that sticker as well. To end off, I can work a minimum wage job, but can't vote for a politician who would raise the minimum wage. I could carry a baby to term whether I wanted to or not. I can suffer 100 degree days, and I get to worry about someone entering my school campus and ending my life. But I cannot vote. I can deal with all of that, but I can't vote. Young people are all under constant threat with nary a way to make substantial change, and I have to just live with that. That is absurd. Young people would vote. I would vote. Even if it was only me, that would be a change worth having. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to return to our panelists for some feedback, and, I, and we are so excited to hear your thoughts on that debate. Mr. Spiva. Um, Great job again. Yeah, yeah, very, very, uh, uh, very moving. Uh, yeah, and uh, I could feel the passion, and it was good. It was, but, but passion com uh, combined with uh, with logic, which is the most powerful of all. Um, uh, I thought you both did a, a terrific job, made compelling uh, 
cases, I think there was one thing, I don't know whether it was you or uh, Congressman Raskin that made this point, but I think one thing that should be said that would affect both of these proposals, which I think are worthy proposals, you know, we have a pa kind of a patchwork system in this country because uh, um, for the most part, uh, the states, you know, run their own elections, even for federal offices. And so a lot of this work um, gets done at the state level. And that's a good and a bad thing, right? It's, it makes it harder to make a national change where it's true everywhere. Um, but at the same time, it sometimes makes it easier. I mean, you know, uh, we unfortunately are not a state. We should be. But we, you know, we have, we have very accessible elections here in the district. Um, and Maryland does as well, and there are a number of states that have very progressive, I don't mean that in a political way, but, a, but uh, easier to vote uh, regimes. Um, so that would, that would be something that would have to be contended with. I'll make one slight, just I'll take one slight tweak to, it wouldn't actually require a constitutional amendment. The 26th Amendment um, requires that no state may deny anybody who's 18 years or older the vote. Um, but it doesn't say you can't allow anybody who's under 18 to vote. So uh, if a state so chose, I don't think any of them have adopted this yet, I believe they could actually lower their voting age uh, to 16, um, for the, just for their state. They couldn't do it for anybody else. So again, you have that national state problem again, which is inherent in, partly inherent in our system of, of federalism. Um, so, but really great job, uh, both of you. I thought, I thought it was good. And you could probably feel that I think all of us, you know, had a lot of empathy and sympathy and, and, and uh, for, for the point of views that you all were advocating, um, you know, and, and I think you, you'd probably have our vote on, uh, on these things, or at least I'll speak for myself. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, I think, I think terrific, uh, terrific job. Mr. Warren, you'll close us out before David takes the stage. Can we give another round of applause for Mr. Matthew and Ms. Montgomery? Um, as, as they were doing their final arguments and we were sitting here talking about active listening, they were not listening to us, thankfully, <laughs> because they were doing their closing arguments, which were fantastic because you addressed the challenges, um, your opponent's arguments and challenges, and just really well done, really, really well done. Um, it makes me, makes me very proud as a former debater. Um, so one quick thing for each of you, and then um, a final thought. Um, Mr. Matthew, I'd encourage you to think about also including a holiday into your arguments. So that actually, I mean, why not have a national paid holiday? And so that people who maybe are going to the post office for the first time can find it and do all the things. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, Ms. Montgomery, I was actually taken by your argument about you working and the taxes coming out of your paycheck. And I kept thinking, why didn't she just talk about the license plates in every car in the district? No taxation without representation. It is a fundamental value that I think you can lean into even more because um, you're being taxed, but you have no representation. Um, but for both of you, really well done. The final thing, um, I'll be a little nerdy and just say I love these proposals. I love that you're thinking about electoral reform. And um, civic engagement goes beyond voting. And I just want to remind us all that uh, there's a French – Social scientist many years ago, 1830s, I think, uh, who came here, before, Alexis de Tocqueville, before our, before our time, for sure, <laughs> Alexis de Tocqueville, and he was, he was surprised to see that we were a nation of joiners, that we were a nation of people that joined associations or organizations, and you are both joiners because you're involved in this <laughs> debate league. So um, I, I would love, as you develop your arguments, to also not forget that we engage in civic life year round, not just once every election cycle. Um, and it's really important that we have sustained, to your point, we have sustained and continued civic engagement, whether that's protest, whether that's just joining a local organization or a high school club, 
Um, but we, we are a nation of joiners, and I hope we can revive that tradition as part of our broader civic engagement and electoral reform. So thank you both for your brilliance and your sharpness tonight. Really appreciate you. If memory serves, uh, Australia has us one better. They don't just have a national holiday for voting, they throw a national barbecue. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a thing where you're supposed to wander down all the, all the vendors and see who has the best food on your way to vote. So you may not be able to find the post office, but you have an incentive to find the polling place. <laughs> so I feel very uh, underwhelmed by your performance because you didn't talk about food. Like, come on guys, it's dinner time. <laughs> um, I'm gonna close us out and I'm gonna put these folks on the stand one more time. Let's be obnoxious and loud and clap them into, into blushing here. <laughs> I want to share two simple messages uh, before we get out of here. Um, the first is uh, about growth. When Maria got started, we probably had about 250, maybe 300 debaters. Um, now we have 800. I need more fingers and toes than we all have in here to count that. <laughs> so uh, when I challenge you, you know, these young people are doing some great work, join us. Come on, judge some debates. Uh, if you can't judge some debates, how about coaching a team? If you can't do that, you know, we've got more mouths to feed, more expandable files to buy, mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, increasingly more tournaments to hold because we can't fit them all in the damn school buildings. <laughs> but just get involved. And I think that that is a uh, great call to what Congressman Raskin was saying about community. If voting is a communal act, um, so is helping raise the next generation. So we'd like y'all to get engaged or stay engaged um, in whatever way that you can and help us out because I have a feeling I'm going to need four digits to count at the end of this year. <laughs> and I'll, the other thing I'll simply say is I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit and go with, with Maria here. Um, it's election season. We had this conversation because we have an important election. So when you've got youth chomping at the bit to be heard, the least we can do is make sure we use our rights too. So go home, have some dinner. Use the QR code on your way out to get involved and go vote uh, in the next month. Mm -hmm. <laughs>